let's get started. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Warren Larkin. I'm a CTO at Blender. And today I'd like to talk to you about search. And I know this is a, this is a Drupal event, but for a couple minutes I'd like to take a step back from that whole Drupal thing and take a look at what are the expectations of our users when it comes to searching. So let's look at a couple examples. Wikipedia, you probably know that, and when you search on Wikipedia, you start typing for whatever you're searching for, and no matter what you type, it figures out what you're mostly looking for, just and you, jump, uh, you jump straight to that, uh, that page. You still have the possibility to do a full text search, but by default, that's not like the, the first option. Um, on Amazon, you also have suggestions when you start typing, but there, the suggestions are not results. These are actually suggested searches. Um, so you have different like completions that go beyond what you, you typed. And then for specific suggestions, they're even combined with a specific uh, category in this case. So that when you select that suggestions, you have the right <coughs> facets already pre-selected in there. On Spotify, you can also search for Drupal. I was surprised you do find something. Um, but uh, when you search something, you also have an autocomplete. And there you have all kinds of stuff uh, that show up in the autocomplete. You, can, you have uh, songs, you have artists, you have albums, you have, in this case, uh, playlists. Um, so you do have a full text search, but actually when, um, well, it, like most things that you could be searching for on Spotify, you will find them in the, in the autocomplete and you will never use the actual full text search. On um, GitHub, you also have a search there. It's actually quite simple, not, nothing fancy. But when you search in something, you are searching by default in this repository. So there are millions of repositories on GitHub. And so there are millions of subsets uh, that users search through. Nobody ever searches through like the entirety of, of GitHub, even though you have a possibility to do that. Uh, what's also interesting is that here, when you search, you actually get not only facets, but you get a visual representation of what kind of result set do you have. So not only what, how many results do you have, but what kind. When you search on Stack Overflow, there also it's quite simple. Um, but when you search for something, what's interesting here is um, how they are sorted. So sorted by relevance, you see that maybe like, the number of votes play a role, but also how many answers you have. Um, and then this same search system is also what powers like, individual tags, uh, some, depending on what kind of activity you want to do, whether you want to answer a question or ask a question or get an overview of something, um, then the different types of sorting actually make uh, play a big role in there, um, in, in what is going to be relevant for the user. So what can we learn from these examples? Well, the first thing is that when it comes to search, there is no one size fits all. Every single project will have different data, will have different users with different needs, and it's important to adapt to the needs of your users um, and you need small details that really matter. Um, and these details actually take place in, at different levels of the uh, technical stack. So you have the UI level where it, like different facets, maybe you want to display your search results differently. Um, you, like a lot of the examples that I showed have autocomplete stuff. Um, so you have, like the, the, the search itself is actually, a, like a, can be a pretty complex front end application in itself. Uh, then at the application level, like what kind of data do you want? How, how do you structure your queries? What are you searching for exactly? How do you prepare that data? And then obviously at the storage level, you need to store that data in a way that makes it possible to retrieve like fuzzy searches uh, from millions of entries in just a couple milliseconds. And so you need adjustments and you need like particular attention to detail at all of these different levels. The other thing that we can learn from these examples is that all of them are based on Elasticsearch. 
actually, there, well, there is one that I don't know that it is based on Elasticsearch, and that one is Amazon. Um, and the reason why I mention that is because a lot of people, when they first hear about Elasticsearch, they think Elastic something that must be an Amazon product. No, actually, it's not. Uh, Elasticsearch is an open source project, just like Drupal. And yeah, talking about Drupal, what does search look like in Drupal? Well, we have a module in Drupal core that comes out enabled out of the box. It must be good, right? Um, and actually, the, the, this little screencast was taken from um, DrupalCon uh, Dublin. Um, and so, yeah, when you search, you get, um, you can search for content. Actually, well, you can search for exact matches in content uh, that was created before the last time that cron ran, um, and, or before the last time. And you also have some advanced searches. Um, yeah, um, but this search actually functions very much in the same way as this search. Um, do you know what this is? Any guesses? Yeah, this is uh, Drupal 4.7. And why do I mention that is, well, if you look at uh, the change log of Drupal, uh, the last time that anything relevant uh, changed in the Drupal core system was actually in Drupal 4.7. Um, it's stayed pretty much the same since then. Just to put that into context, these devices did not exist back then. And this website was still very cool. Um, so if you care about search, don't use the core search. Because the biggest risk you have is that users might actually try to use it. But the core search is not the, it's, it's not the only option. So already quite a while ago, um, this guy, Robert Douglas, and a couple of other people try, tried to push uh, the, the idea forward to to use Apache Solar with Drupal. And there was a, a Drupal module of the same name that, um, yeah, that integrated Apache Solar with Drupal. Here's a, like all the features that it provides from the official module page. Uh, but really, what were the, selling, the, the main selling points? So the first one is that it's fast. Because searching is something that's really difficult uh, in terms of like algorithms, in terms of like scaling and performance. Um, and so you need to have a dedicated system to be able to handle it well uh, and to handle that in a, in a way that scales. Second, um, Solar can do proper text analysis. So you can do stemming, you can do fuzzy searches, all the kind of things that make it possible to be tolerant towards your users so that they don't know to know, they, they don't need to know exactly what words are in the thing that they're looking for, they can just type whatever they feel they're searching for, and we can be tolerant towards them. And then um, Solar does facets. Um, and facets, it, it's not only the widget, but it's also this idea that you start with a very generic keyword search, and then you get an idea of what kind of results you have, and then you iteratively refine your, your search by specifying different facets. And what's great about this is that you're always refining within the, re the existing result set. So you never end up with a situation where you choose something that will have no results. Um, and that, that's a, a great, uh, like that, that's really a great UI concept. Uh, but somehow as a community, we got stuck on this idea that um, facets are really the essence of a powerful search. Um, and yeah, I mean, facets are great. Don't get me wrong, but there's a lot more to just facets. And I think these first two points here, the performance and really the text analysis and the like, tolerance towards your, your users, they're much less visible, but they are much more important if you want to build search interfaces that actually just work. Of course, I need to mention Search API if I'm talking about Search and Drupal. Um, search API, like, does anybody not know Search API? Okay, um, but yeah, in short, Search API does everything that Apache Solar does, but it provides a plugin system that lets you do uh, that with other search backends, and it also integrates very nicely with uh, standard site building tools like Views. Um, and we've built a lot of very cool stuff with Search API over the years. 
but personally, I had a couple of issues with search API. The first one is that it's an abstraction of solar. So it's not an abstraction of a search system. Um, and that's actually something that would be very difficult to do. It's an abstraction of the functionality provided by the Apache Solar module for Drupal. Um, so it, it's actually quite restricted. It lets you plug in, like replace solar with other systems, but it, that won't give you uh, much more functionality. Second, everything is, uh, is based on configuration. And I mean, that, that's great because it means that you can just log into your site and just create all, all your configuration, how you want things to be indexed. Um, but at the same time, there are certain problems that are better addressed with code than with configuration. And personally, I think that search is one of those. And as a consequence of that, search API implementations are difficult to customize. So it's okay to customize those if you, if you can use the options that are available, but if you want to go beyond that, you need to hook into the search API to then hook into the API of the underlying system. So you really need to learn two different APIs to, um, to do some sometimes awkward maneuvers to actually do small adjustments that are, in the end, quite simple. But I'm not here to, to like, say bad things about search API. I actually think that search API does serve very uh, useful purpose in the, the Drupal ecosystem, but I like to talk about Elasticsearch. And the first contact that I had with Elasticsearch was uh, quite a few years ago when we built uh, one, one very interesting application that combined uh, Drupal and Node.js and, and Solar uh, to do some document management um, for, for private users. Um, and at some point, we ran into like, some really critical issues with, with Solar, and we decided to give Elasticsearch a try. And within something like a day of work, we were able to completely replace Solar with Elasticsearch. Everything worked a lot better. And we're like, hey, this is great. Um, and you don't need to take my word for, for it. Uh, if you just look on the internet, who is using Elasticsearch, what people are saying about it, um, there's a pretty good consensus. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, who is using Elasticsearch? Pretty much everyone. A lot of huge companies. Facebook is using Elasticsearch. Microsoft is using Elasticsearch. Um, and <coughs> using Solar, well, Drupal people. Um, no, there, there are some more, but um, the, the trend here is, is pretty clear. So what's so great about Elasticsearch? Actually, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the details. You can read up on the website. They have some very good uh, materials there. But I think there's one point that is really important for the kind of work that we do as Drupal developers. Um, and that's a developer-friendly RESTful API. Developer-friendly means that it's actually a nice API that you want to work with, unlike, for example, um, Solar. Um, and so it, it's so nice that you don't want to put it behind an abstraction layer like Search API. Um, it's an API that you just want to use. And also, well, it's RESTful. That means that it works in the same way as the stuff that we do on a daily basis. So it's not some kind of like other kind of technology that is unfamiliar to us. Uh, it's something that we can just use and, and we understand we don't need to learn new concepts to do that. So we had this situation about one year and a half ago where a customer came to us and they wanted an intranet. That was at the very early, like that was before the Drupal 8 release. Uh, we were just getting started with building um, Drupal 8 uh, websites. But what the customer wanted, they wanted something that's simple. So a very simple intranet. But one of the main features that they wanted to have was should have search. And that search also had to be simple. You just start typing anywhere on the site. But it also had to be powerful. It had to search through users, search through content, search through the company calendars that just comes from an external API. And at the time, search API was not ready. Um, there was an implementation of uh, Elasticsearch for search API. It also wasn't ready. Uh, and we decided to just create something simple. And this is what we created. Um, this is some sample context. And uh, there she 
should be a video playing. Yep. Okay, and so you start typing anywhere on the site, and you can search for users. You can also search for content. Um, and yeah, it's you just have the search overlay that pops up and just takes you wherever you want to go. So how can you build something like that, like a very minimal version of that? And actually, this is pretty close to the original implementation that we had. Um, so first, you need to install Elasticsearch. How do you do that? You get it, you unzip it, you run it. That's, well, that, that's not what you're going to do on a production environment. That's probably not what you can do uh, on your like, proper local development environment. But if you just want to give it a try, it doesn't get really much faster than that. Um, and actually, if you want to do that in production, you probably want to use um, just uh, packages that are available or Docker images, depending on what your infrastructure is. Um, so getting up and running is really easy. Then the second thing, we need to talk to Elasticsearch. It uses a REST API, but there's a very good library for it uh, that you can use, uh, you can install it just with Composer. So I guess everybody here is using Composer for your AAA projects, right? Yes, okay. Um, and so you just do that and yeah, you're ready to start indexing content. So your content, we assume it's going to be in nodes, which are entities. So the basic uh, example on how to do that, we implement our good old hook entity update. We instantiate a client, uh, of course, you would put this in a dedicated service, dependency injection, and so on. This is just the like, most minimal uh, code to, um, to get up and running. So we connect to our host, and then we call the index method. We specify that we want to put uh, stuff in, it. in an index called content, then in a type called article. The type is to an index more or less what a table is to a database in MySQL terms like very rough analogy. We can optionally give it an ID so that we can later on um, just refer to that en entry. And then for the body, well, we just pass it the entity as is. Um, the good thing here is that, hey, look, we have content in our index. The bad thing is that what we have in our index is this monstrosity here. Um, we have a node ID, which is an array of objects which have an attribute called value, and in that attribute, we have a number as a string. Um, so this is not exactly the kind of stuff that you want to uh, be having, for example, in your like, JavaScript front-end application. This is also not the kind of things you want to have in your search index. So what we do, we use the serialization API, more specifically the normalizers, from provided uh, with Drupal core. And so when we have an entity save, we serialize the data and um, <coughs> with a custom serializer and we put that into Elasticsearch. The result is that we have something like that. We have a label, this is a, a string. The user could be like an object uh, with an ID and a name. It's like deserialized in there. Uh, images could be like a link directly to a specific, um, spec uh, to a specific uh, image style. Um, and what's great about Elasticsearch is that you can just send that and we'll take it and index it like that and you can get it back out in the same format, something that's, for example, not possible with Solar. Um, but sometimes you want to be more specific about the schema. So you want to say, for example, that uh, with your properties, so you create, you explicit, explicitly define a mapping and you say, well, the created property, yes, it is a number, but it's a number with a, like, it's a timestamp, so we want to specify that it's a type date, and the format is going to be epoch seconds, uh, so that it gets analyzed like a date, so that you can date, do, like, date facets, date histograms, uh, everything like that. Um, also, maybe the, the content, it's going to be specified as English, so we get proper stemming. Um, you, can also specify other languages, like most European languages are supported out of the box, so this is really useful. Um, sometimes you have like fields, like uh, a URL, uh, it is a string, but we don't actually want to analyze that, so we don't want to do like split it into words thing, we, we just want to keep it as it is. So now we have our data that's indexed, and how do you search for it? Um, 
Well, we instantiate our client. This would typically be in a, in a controller. We can search across one or multiple indices at the same time. So for example, for this example that I, um, that I showed, uh, searching through users, searching through projects at the same time, you can do all of that in one query. And then this is a little bit more complex, but this is actually pretty close to what we use. Um, of course, you would want to escape that. Do not copy any code from these slides and put them in production. That's a bad idea. Um, but it, it shows like the basic uh, mechanisms. So we take the input of our users, we pass this to the query, we search through the label and label the autocomplete fields. And what's happening here is that so label dot autocomplete is going to be the version of the label that split up letter by letter. So you actually get this search as you type functionality that you get matches even before you've entered a full word. But if you do have a full word, so without the dot autocomplete, then you're going to boost these um, this specific uh, result so that when you get exact matches, these will show up before partial matches. Um, and then the fuzziness is it's a number, usually it's a number of characters that can be off. So how many typos do you enable? Um, and when you specify auto, it will just allow you to be, like, Elasticsearch will just be more tolerant the longer your, uh, your input straight in is. And here, one small but really important detail, something that we learned through experience, uh, the prefix length. The prefix length is actually how many characters at the beginning of the string are exempt from that fuzziness. So how many characters are not allowed to be wrong. And this made our search a lot more intuitive. Let me show you why. So um, I have this example. I'm looking for my colleague, um, Tony. And so I'm typing Tony. And I see I have my colleague, Tony. I also have my other colleague, Tony. And of course, well, this one, it's, it's a suggestion because maybe I mistyped uh, like the N and the N. It's like right next to each other on the keyboard. So that kind of makes sense. And then the customer was complaining that Johnny was showing up there. It's like, but th this doesn't make sense. Why, why is that showing up? And we said, well, actually, there's one letter that's off, just like Tommy. It's like, it, it feels wrong. And the reason is, actually, the way the brain interprets text and recognizes words, uh, the first letter is a lot more important. Uh, and also, when you type something, the first letter is almost never mistyped. But, so if you have typos, it's usually later on in the word. Uh, so it's the small amount of, like small level of details that actually when you put this prefix length, then Johnny would not show up in this list. Um, and this is important to <coughs> understand what is the purpose of that search that you're building. Uh, so when you're building an autocomplete like this, the purpose is not to, like, to surprise the user to show stuff, hey, did you think about this? When you're building an autocomplete, you want to guess what the user wants to see. Um, and so you want to, to be just like intuitive. It, the user will be typing, and you have like a fraction of a second to react and to just save a couple keystrokes. But this is not the place where you want to like surprise the user. This is what the search result page is for. So yeah, this is what we built. It actually worked out really nicely. It was very simple. Um, customer was happy. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we were under budget. The team was happy. We decided, hey, this is actually working out really well. Um, so let's, let's use this for, for other project. So here's another project that we built. Uh, this is a company that does uh, paper and office products. Um, and a typical use case, you buy like their print at home business cards uh, from the store. Then you get a little code on the box that says, go to our website, search for this, and you will get the template. So here we are uh, the user. Better is dead, I guess. Um, no.
Yeah. Okay. So you go to a website, you um, you type your product code, and you get to uh, the you get to the product. Um, if you want to do parsing on and like auto completion on product codes, of course that's going to work differently from a full text search. Um, so small things that you need to like plan with. Um, but also some users come to the site not knowing about the product codes and they're just looking for something and they're we want to do the same thing, the same kind of thing that you have on Amazon, that you're looking for like business cards and it like it gives you some suggestion for like what kind of business cards are you looking for. Um, so really so, like, um, suggesting uh, searches for your users. And how do we do that? We actually use, um, well, this, the same kind of queries that you would do to get data for facets. Um, so you do an aggregation, but that's more generic terms for, uh, for facets. And we call this suggestive terms. It's going to be a terms aggregation on the field suggestions. We use the raw version because we don't want to analyze these. We actually want to get them straight as they were entered. Um, and then we just include only the ones that match uh, the, the input from the user. Um, and then um, when, we, uh, when we get the results, we just go through the aggregation, the suggested terms. So we get the same key that we used, uh, that we specified before, go through each bucket, and just create a response like that. So custom code, yes but something that's actually relatively easy, a couple lines of code. Um, and we, we had, uh, this was working pretty well, and then we had one specific request from the customer. Um, so I think everybody here is familiar with paper sizes, um, and one thing that everybody knows is that A4 is the more common paper size. Um, and the customer asked that, well, if you have a product that comes in A4, A5, and A3, Actually, A4 should be the first product. How do you sort that so that four comes before five and three? Um, well, we did this. So we had a Boolean query that combines our original request that like the content should match our input, and at the same time, a should clause. So this is like, if you could do this, this would be great. If, if not, that's OK. Um, and so here, we looked at the, the size of the paper is size A4. Um, and that makes it so that like A4 products actually show up before, so they don't show up at the top, but the same product um, in different that's available in different sizes, the size A4 will be showing up first. What's interesting here is that this is specified at query time, so there's nothing stopping you from putting some dynamic value in here. So you can very easily build personalization based on this. Uh, either based on user preferences, you could, base, it could be based on what the user, uh, like the history of the user, um, and this is really powerful to build like interfaces that really adapt to the user that just like follow along as a as a user is, is just coming to your site. Another example here, this is um, a real estate tool for real estate professionals. You have all kind of parametric uh, searches. But what we're using here, um, well, one of the features is that these people are really busy people, and they don't want to keep on coming to your site and every hour just search again and see if there's <coughs> something new. So we built some saved searches so that they get notifications whenever something new matches one of their searches. And if you've ever tried to do this, um, this is a, the type of functionality that doesn't scale well at all. Like, the more number of, like, the bigger the number of searches you have, the bigger number of results. Um, just running each search on Chrome, it, it doesn't, it really doesn't scale at all. So what we're using is a percolator. A percolator is a coffee machine, a coffee maker uh, that was pretty popular in the 70s that makes apparently pretty terrible coffee. Um, but it's what gave the name to this percolator API uh, in Elasticsearch. And a percolator is a way that you can, the same way that you index documents, you can index searches. And later on, you can make a percolator query where you pass, uh, you give a document to Elasticsearch, and you can tell it which of the saved searches would have this document here as a result. 
so it it's, takes some time uh, getting your, your head around that, but it's actually a really practical uh, API that lets you do safe searches in a way that scales like indefinitely um, or infinitely. And um, yeah, and, and it's very simple, very easy to implement, uh, and that gave us some very clean code. So after doing a couple of projects like this where we had a small amount of custom code uh, that was very, very useful, we realized, well, there are certain things that we could uh, standardize. And so we created this Elasticsearch helper module, uh, which we use now on, on a dozen projects, um, and we've we've seen quite a few people adopting that uh, as well in like outside of Blender. And um, so what does it do? Well, out of the box, it doesn't do anything. Um, the only thing it does, it defines a plugin type. And when you, when you uh, instantiate that plugin, what, uh, what you get is, um, so you create a, name, a class uh, that has some annotation, give it a name, label, and then you specify what's the index name and what's the type name. So just Elasticsearch index and type. And optionally, you can specify like this, an entity type. And when you do that, um, the module will automatically uh, index all your entities of that type whenever they get saved, updated, deleted, and so on. Um, and so you do that, and you eventually specify a custom uh, custom normalizer if you want to have more control over how your data is indexed. Um, and it, it just works. And if you want to do something different when you're indexing content, when you're like, updating content, uh, how, how you define your mappings, what you can do, uh, since you're just extending that base class, um, you can just override any function. For example, uh, if you want to do translation, you can say that instead of uh, just calling the parent directly, you just go through each translation, and then you index each translation separately in a dedicated index, so you get the same structure across all of your, um, all of your translations, all of your languages, but at the same time, for each language, you will have language-specific um, uh, analysis of, of text. Um, so what, what's great about this is that the whenever you need to do something, what you're using is actually the Elasticsearch API. So you, you don't need to learn any new API in order um, to, to use Elasticsearch Helper. So the only API you need to learn is the Elasticsearch API. So it's very tra transparent. And using this, well, you can use, um, well, the, the couple of examples that I showed before, they're using React or Angular frontends. Uh, but you can also use this with very simple uh, views-based, like old-style uh, or classic site building tools provided by Drupal. And this is a site we built for a Finnish customer. Um, so you search for something, and this here is actually coming from a view. These are like specific view modes, um, so really nothing very uh, special that, that was created there. And it, so it works for complex use cases. It also works really well for simple use cases. And one thing that, um, th th that is important to notice here, and I think that this guy said it really well, um, yeah, search boxes are good for letting you find your results. But sometimes it's really important to get an overview, what, what kind of results do you have? Um, and facets are a way to do that. Another example, and this is from a project that co uh, colleagues in Belgium did, uh, searching for student housing. Um, so when you display things on a map, uh, it actually gives you an idea of what kind of result set do you have. Are all of these things in one place? How far apart are they spread? Um, and this is, this is really useful uh, in terms of getting an idea, am, am I looking for the right thing with the kind of uh, search criteria that I entered? N now, there's actually a, another project that I'd like to talk about, uh, and this is uh, Spocek. Spocek is uh, a large uh, shop for uh, sports, uh, sporting goods, so one of the biggest in, in Germany, uh, both like with physical uh, stores and also online, and they have something like, like half a million products. Um, and so they have dedicated team that just like manages like SEO data for these projects, uh, for these products. 
and it's, it's so much data that is difficult to just manage, and just having a list of all that is not really useful. And so we built a tool for them to let them analyze the, the data that they have and, and manage it so that they can like, assign entire like, product categories to like, dedicated copywriting agencies. And uh, here, th this actually looks like a very classic like, Drupal uh, backend listing. Um, but actually, this is coming from Elasticsearch. And uh, the, one of the reasons why you pull all of the data out of Elasticsearch is performance. So for listings like this, yeah, it works. Views actually works. Uh, but if you have a listing, like let's say, with 32,000 entries, which we do have for, for some, uh, some kinds of listing, views completely chokes. It, it cannot handle that. Um, and Elasticsearch, in this case, is so much more performant that it's not only faster, but it makes things possible that would not be otherwise possible, that would require really complex like batching processes and things like that. Um, and so in this case, it makes it possible to do um, like listings like this, but also to provide more interesting visualization that, like again, give an overview of, uh, of what kind of content we have. So in this case, they, the admin can go through the product categories and decide to assign like, for example, the category Nordic walking to a specific uh, copywriting agency. Um, and so this actually gives you a very good idea of what kind of stuff am I dealing with. Um, and the data for this tree, after a good amount of optimization, loading that, the data from, uh, from the entity system, it took two seconds. I think, actually, yeah, two seconds, that's, I mean, that's long, but that's, that's okay for, for this kind of scenario. And then we switched to Elasticsearch, and getting that same data took like less than 200 milliseconds. And actually, the 200 milliseconds what, was mostly Drupal Bootstrap and transferring the data. Um, so that, that's the kind of stuff that's like, I mean, it's really at least 10 times faster. And the more data you have, the more, like, you, the more you'll see a difference. And what's interesting in this case is that uh, we are getting data from elsewhere. So this is not, like, not, uh, the, these pr uh, products are not Drupal entities. They're coming from elsewhere from a different system. And what we do, we serialize that data and treat it in Elasticsearch. So we don't put everything in entities. Um, we can just like, get data and put it straight in Elasticsearch and use it directly there. And what's interesting, once we have this data in Elasticsearch, is we can enable uh, Kibana. And Kibana is a data visualization tool that lets you create graphs easily uh, of, of all your data. It's used a lot for monitoring, uh, log monitoring. Uh, but you can just put any data in it. And this is a tool that we put in the hands of our customers, so they can create custom, um, custom graphs uh, and explore the data that they have on their own. And this is really powerful if you want to have a good discussion about the data that you have, uh, engage with your customers, like. What, what is relevant, what, is, like, what can we learn from the data. Um, and yeah, Kibana, it's, you can install it just as quickly as Elasticsearch. And um, what's great is like, whenever you use Elasticsearch for searching, then you can use Kibana. And we have cases where we, we use this for, um, for just a project that we, we took over. There was some existing data. And based on some, just a couple of graphs, we were able to tell the history of what people have been working on that site, at what times, who were the admins, who was responsible, and tell the history of the site um, actually better than the people at our clients could, uh, because we were able to visualize the data and say, hey, look, this guy worked here, and then he left the company, and that's, the, that's when the other person took over, and so on. Uh, so even with small data sets, it's really amazing sometimes the kind of data that you can get out of uh, yeah, uh, out of it when, when you have the proper tools in place. Now we're actually getting to the, the beyond part of uh, search. So the, most of the, the example that I showed, well, we have Drupal, we send data to Elasticsearch, and then we ask questions from Elasticsearch to like, do queries. Uh, but that, that's not the only scenario that, that, that it's useful for. Uh, we've seen quite a few cases, especially in the, the media and publishing sector, um, that we have one entity that, uh, one Drupal instance, 
that is a content management system that pushes content into Elasticsearch. And then we have another front-end instance that actually queries Elasticsearch. And this is where all the, the content aggregations and like placements, uh, all of that happens. And here, this is where the editors or the, the, the journalists or uh, whoever's writing the content uh, is, is working. So that, that's something that's quite powerful, this kind of like, uh, do, like s separation of concerns. Uh, but there's nothing that specifies that this should be Drupal. Uh, maybe it could be uh, like Silex application, like Lightweight Symfony uh, stack. Uh, it could be Django application. We actually have uh, a, a customer that's like a video game company that you probably know. Um, and they're serving this content for their website through, through that. They're also serving uh, the content for the games through various gaming console, or any gaming console that you can think of, they're on it, and all the data is coming originally from Drupal through Elasticsearch and being delivered through a different technology. Um, and so you're using each of these tools at what these tools do best. So Drupal is good for content management system, but if you're talking about like a REST backend for applications, um, I mean, we love to talk about like the, the REST module, but like realistically, it's not the best. Um, and then there's, uh, you also have other possibilities, like Internet of Things. I mean, if you want to, your toaster to talk to like some kind of data store, uh, maybe actually Drupal is not the best backend. Maybe Elasticsearch is a better backend. Uh, and just to include a couple of buzzwords, um, well, if you want to create a chatbot or like some kind of like conversational interfaces, actually Elasticsearch is a much better backend to ask the kind of like fuzzy, uh, fuzzy queries uh, that the user will ask. Um, and so if we need to put something in the center uh, of, uh, of our like multi-technology stack, uh, maybe in the, in the middle, it's better not to have <coughs> Drupal, but Elasticsearch. And I think this is something that's quite powerful. So when we're talking about decoupled uh, infrastructures, well, I mean, if you're putting a Drupal-specific JavaScript, uh, JavaScript code in your front end, um, is that really decoupled? Um, I would say no. Uh, and I think with something like this, it's a lot easier to say, well, replace Drupal with another content management system, replace your front end with another one. Um, and yeah, today we're good at building websites. And people will say, web application, platforms, and so on. It's all stuff that opens up in a browser. Um, and there's some interesting intersection between website and search, but there's a lot bigger thing uh, beyond just uh, just websites. And I think it's important to get good at that part too. Um, this way we will have a job and an interesting one, even when, when websites are obsolete. So in summary, I think that, well, search matters. And search matters to the point that you need to pay attention to details and you need to have the right adjustments in the right place uh, and that's what's going to make a difference between a search that your users like fall back to using when when really needed uh, and a search that have, like, your users will use without even noticing it um, and Elasticsearch actually has a really expressive API that lets you uh, easily create those adjustments that really make it possible to use, uh, to create these kind of uh, experiences. And the difficulty here is not learning the API. That's actually really easy. The difficulty is learning the concepts, learning like how do you do that? Um, and that's quite, a, that's kind of, yeah, it, it's a challenge because these are things that are, need to be really intuitive, but we need to understand how that exactly works. But one thing, that is clear is that Elasticsearch is fun. And to me, this is really what motivates me to just come to different events and talk about Elasticsearch. Because if I come home at the end of the day and I'm really happy about the technology that I'm working with, this is a whole new level of value. Um, and I'd like to thank a lot of people uh, that have worked with Elasticsearch, that have told me about their challenges, their use cases, their bugs, their bug fixes. Um, and I hope that you also learned something today that you will get a chance to play with Elastic version to build cool stuff. And if you have anything that you build that is cool, definitely let me know. 
because I'm very excited to, to hear about it. So, any questions? Yes? Um, have you encountered uh, any scenarios where um, another service that does search you, such as uh, Google, Google Places, uh, that's that big that's price thing brings some results back? Uh, you think of any scenarios where Elasticsearch can sort of play with another search tool uh, and then do something more than the, the, the original thing for those? Um, not really, um, but the, one of the use cases that I could imagine is like you search through the, the, the results that you have, and then if you don't find anything, you actually fall back to using something that's, that's wider. Um, and we actually have a couple of cases.